Okay, so what I wanted to do was actually go over some happy news uh, that is happening in the world of science and physics right now, but I can't do that because this paper has just come to my attention, and keep in mind it is on MedArchive, so it is pre-peer-reviewed, but um, it needed to be said right away. So remember back in episode 29, um, here I had this episode, uh, I had this episode up. It's can viruses and autoantibodies cause Alzheimer's? So um, in this particular video, I had discussed um, how autoantibodies or autoimmune antibodies that will attack your own brain or attack the protein hormones within your own brain. This is frequently associated with things such as um, depression, major depression, anxiety, post-traumatic stress disorder, um, and other uh, diseases such as Alzheimer's, multiple sclerosis, um, Parkinson's. And so what, what the reason why I brought it up then was because I was concerned that since SARS-CoV-2 and a lot of other coronaviruses will mimic the peptide hormones within your brain and they also mimic um, just a lot of proteins of the host organism that they're in, in fact, they will even make chimeric proteins using part of your own genetics in order to, um, I don't know if it, if that was intentionally to create autoantibodies or if that was, um, what would the word be? <sighs> Just know that viruses will frequently use your own proteins against you and then mimic your own proteins, which ends up causing autoimmune diseases. And what my concern was, was this SARS-CoV-2 and other viruses might be employing this in order to modulate your immune system, which they do, we know that for a fact, but one of the long-lasting side effects of that is that you end up having autoantibodies against your own peptide hormones and against your own brain. And so this is something that I had brought up about a month ago on June 11th, and I went over a few papers that helped demonstrate what are some of the consequences of this. And so now it just so happens that now there this pre-peer-reviewed paper has come out on MedArchive, a uh, high frequency of cerebrospinal fluid autoantibodies in COVID-19 patients with neurological symptoms. So um, here they went over a cohort of people who have shown that after contracting COVID-19, they have uh, at least presented some form of neurological symptoms. And then by going into the cerebrospinal fluid, they were able to find uh, high levels, or I shouldn't say high, I haven't read the paper yet myself, but they have shown levels of antibodies that were detectable, which would normally indicate that they are higher than usual. So um, let us continue. And one of the things that I have to note um, is that you will always, if you are searching for autoantibodies, you are going to find them. Everyone produces some level of autoantibodies against most of the proteins within their own body, but they are so supposed to be very weakly attacking, and they're also supposed to be very, very low concentrations of them. And this is how, or the reason why you don't have, um, the average person doesn't have an autoimmune disease, because all of those autoantibodies are kept low and in check. So... Um, that is just one thing that I'm making note here. So um, just because these people found these autoantibodies in the cerebrospinal fluid does not mean explicitly that it is higher than normal concentration. So we need to at least be a little bit critical there. So abstract. The COVID-19 intensive care patients occasionally develop neurological symptoms. The absence of SARS-CoV-2 in most cerebrospinal fluid samples suggests the involvement of further mechanisms, including autoimmunity. So this is something that, um, so viruses, a lot of them might have difficulty crossing the blood-brain barrier. So um, perhaps, um, so we've been seeing some, some levels of inflammation of uh, like neuritis, mellitus, encephalitis. We've been seeing a little bit of that in patients with COVID-19. And so uh, one of the things that could have been happening is okay, maybe, maybe there's blood clotting that is causing inflammation in places throughout the entire body. Uh, but another thing that um, unfortunately could also be happening is the production of autoantibodies that can 
maybe not usually past the blood-brain barrier in high concentrations, but maybe enough to start causing damage to those tissues. Okay, and I believe, um, is it the glial cells? I, I, forget, I think there might be, there might be a immune cell that is supposed to be in the brain, but I can't remember which one it is, if there is one. Anyways, let's continue. So we therefore determined whether antineuronal or antiglial, which is not a neuron, but it is, uh, it's one of the nursing cells of the, wait, it's one of the progenitors to astrocytes, if I'm remembering correctly. So the glia, also called glial cells are, or neuroglia, are the non-neuronal cells in the central nervous system. And, uh, the peripheral nervous system that do not produce electrical impulses. And I believe the glia will, some of them will turn into or differentiate into astrocytes as well. But um, don't quote me on that until I reread this. Um, the illustration of the four different types of glial cells. So the ependymal cells, which are in light pink that do this. The Okay, so the astrocytes are a subset of the, yeah, so these green, green things are a form of glial cell. Okay, that's right. Regardless, let's continue. And so we therefore determine whether antineuronal or antiglial autoantibodies are present in 11 con consecutive severely ill COVID-19 patients uh, presenting with unexplained neurological symptoms. And these include uh, myoclonus, Cranial nerve. Okay, let's let's look up these individual things. So myoclonus. So what is this? Spasmodic. So spasms are jerky contractions of the muscle. So uh, they they could include spasms. They could include uh, cranial nerve involvement. So let's look up what that means explicitly. So. Hmm. Palsy. Is that what it is? Wait. Let's look up what it. Okay, so it must be just cranial nerve disease of some form. So that would be a form of palsy. So uh, Bell's or, or uh, what was it? Bell's palsy. And I think there's another common palsy as well. But uh, my father actually um, had one of those for a hot second. Uh, anyways, ocular, oculomotor disturbance. So this would probably, I would presume, be the movement of the eye that is not working properly. Okay. So, eye condition resulting from damage to the third cranial nerve, cranial nerve or a branch thereof, and the oculomotor nerve supplies the majority of the muscles controlling the eye, so not being able to control the eye movement as easily. Um, delirium, uh, dystonia, so what is dystonia? And let's, I like getting Wikipedia up so I don't have to worry about copyright, so sustained or repetitive muscles contractions resulting in twisting and repetitive movements or abnormal abnormal fixed positions. So here would be an example of a person with uh, medication-induced dystonia um, or epileptic seizure. seizure. So uh, there were a group of COVID-19 patients that showed some or at least one of these neurological conditions. And so they looked in the, into the subset of people with COVID-19 to see do they have these autoantibodies against either their neurons or their glial cells? Anyways, most po patients showed signs of CSF or, uh, wait, uh, cerebrospinal fluid? Yeah. Yeah, cerebrospinal fluid inflammation and increased levels of neurofilament light chain. So what is a neuro... I believe this would be a protein, a biomarker that would... Uh, yeah, so as a biomarker in neurological something, so let's look up the Wikipedia. So um, also known as neurofilament line chain, this is a neurofilament protein and that is in humans and is encoded by NEPHEL. A neurofilament line chain is a biomarker that can be measured in with immunoassays in cerebrospinal fluid and plasma and reflects axonal damage. So when the axons of your nerves get damaged, uh, this is a protein that might leak into the environment. And when you see this leaking, um, that could be, it's referred to as a biomarker. So it's a marker by which we look and try to determine, um, we can determine a pathology or a disease based on these biomarkers. 
So when they, when you see this neurofilament-like peptide in the cerebrospinal fluid or the plasma, that's not good because it's supposed to be within the neuron. So if you see this, that is not good. So, um, so patients showed signs of inflammation and increased levels of neurofilament light chain, and all patients had antineuronal autoantibodies in serum or CSF when assessing a large panel of autoantibodies against intracellular and surface antigens relevant for the central nervous system diseases using cell-based assays and an indirect immunofluorescence on murine brain section. So that is a paragraph or a sentence. So um, let's see. Um, so all patients have the antineuronal autoantibodies in the serum or the cerebrospinal fluid um, when assessing a large panel of autoantibodies, which are against the intracellular and surface antigens of relevant, which are relevant for central nervous system diseases. So what they did was they looked through a panel of different types of surface antigens or antigens that are on the surfaces of nerves and or glial cells, but they chose the ones that are known to be associated with certain pathological diseases. So they run these autoantibody tests against those known antigens, and every single one of these people showed significant levels of these autoantibodies. And they did this with the cell-based assays and indirect uh, immunofluorescence on the murine brain sections. Interesting. So it looks like, hmm... So it looks like they might have taken mouse brains. So this is what murine brain sections are. They took mouse brains. They ended up probably incubating these mouse brains or mouse tish brain tissue with uh, the serum or the cerebrospinal fluid of these people. And if there were auto if there were antibodies against the antigens on the mouse brain, um, then they would probably have another antibody. They would add something that would hook up to the human antibodies and then create fluorescence and that would show you on a microscope slide or show you on, I'll just say a microscope slide, that there was antibodies present or human antibodies present at that tissue location. Anyways, antigens included proteins well established in clinical routines such as the Y, Y not or the NMDA receptor. So let's, I don't know what this is. What is the, um, receptor let's see uh, NMDA receptor let's look at that instead so the activated N methyl activated NMDR so this is the glutamate one okay N methyl D aspartate receptor also known as NMDA it's a glutamate receptor and ion channel protein found in nerve cells. So, uh, for, um, okay, so that would be examples of the well-established antigens that they search for, but also a variety of specific undetermined epitopes on brain sections. So they didn't just look at the ones that are known, that are common. They also looked at a bunch of different uh, other antigens or epitopes that have not been looked at before. So these included vessel endothelium, astrocytic proteins, and neutro neutropil of basal ganglia. And these are just different cell types within the brain. Um, and neutropil of the basal ganglia, hypocamus, or olfactory bulb. And so um, they probably cared about the olfactory bulb because there are some people that have shown uh, anosmia or the inability to smell properly. So the high frequency of autoantibodies targeting the brain in the absence of other explanations suggests a casual relationship to clinical symptoms, in particular to hyperexcitability, um, such as the myoclonus or seizures. So um, when I think of hyperexcitability, what I'm thinking of, maybe these antibodies are, uh, are attaching to some of the receptors. Um, so if they happen to attach to some of the receptors, that receptor might be easily triggered uh, or be triggered just by being attacked by the antibody. So let's, um, let's look at hyper nerves and Wikipedia.
is a form of peripheral nerve hyperexcitability that causes spontaneous muscular activity. Okay, so uh, if yeah, if they're hyperactive or hyperexcitable, that means that they're going to release a signal too easily. So this is why we might be seeing myoclonus and seizures in some people. Um, while several underlying autoantigens still await identification in future studies, presence of autoantibodies may explain some aspects of multi-organ disease in COVID-19 and can guide immunotherapy in selected cases. So, um, should I go over the entire thing or just... Yeah, this is short enough. I'll go over the entire thing. So, introduction. A broad variety of neurological symptoms has been observed in COVID-19 patients. Uh, clinical findings comprise hypo hyposmia, um, which is reduced ability to smell. So hyposmia and hy hypogusia, I think inability to taste properly. Let me, yeah, the reduced ability to taste things in mild cases. So can smell less and can taste less in mild cases and agitation, diffuse corticospinal tract signs and myoclonus. So what is the diffuse cortical spinal tract signs? I think is that wiki. Isn't it just inflammation of this entire area? You know what? Let let's continue. I don't think I'll be able to parse that right away. So just know that that's another um, another issue. Uh, so in severe cases of COVID-19, neurological syndromes in associated with SARS-CoV-2 inc include many autoimmune diseases, such as the Guillain-Barre syndrome, or GBS, the Miller-Fisher syndrome, or MFS, and the polyneuritis, polyneuritis cranialis, meningitis, encephalitis, stroke, uh, encephalitis is, is uh, what's it called, uh, inflammation of the brain stroke, epilepsy, and myopathy, which would be, uh, nope, not. Um, the disease in muscles where the muscles do not function properly, which would, I, I presume, cause some muscle loss as well. So what is the uh, Guillain-Barre syndrome? Um, this is just an attack on the nerves. So, and let us do Wikipedia so that we're not... Rapid onset of muscle weakness caused by the immune system damaging the peripheral nervous system. So the your immune system ends up attacking your own nerves in the periphery of your body. So this would be something that could cause rapid onset of muscle weakness. Uh, there's the Miller-Fisher syndrome, which let's look that up as well. A rare, rare, let us do Wikipedia so that we're not... Oh, interesting. Oh, Miller-Fisher is a variant of the Guillain-Barre syndrome, uh, which is a triad of weakness of the eye muscles, abnormalities in, coordinate, in coordination as well. So, yeah, so Miller-Fisher syndrome is a subset of the Guillain-Barre syndrome. Uh, and then polyneuritis, cranialis, I don't know what that is. So let's do Wikipedia. Polyneuropathy is damage or disease affecting peripheral nerves. So it's not just the cerebral spinal fluid. It's not just the brain and the brain stem that you have to worry about. Apparently, your peripheral nerves have also are also implicated in being damaged and partly due to the immune system attacking them. So it is debated whether direct virus invasion into the brain can cause pathology. However, SARS-CoV-2 has been detected only scarcely in the cerebral spinal fluid. So uh, the coronaviruses, for one, it seems that they're difficult to get a positive sample from them in that um, there's not a lot of genetic material, it seems like, to, like, even in bats, when, when, the, when the scientists are studying bat coronaviruses or the bat pathogens, um, the coronaviruses are notoriously elusive. So even in a bat that is that has a coronavirus living inside of it, it's very difficult to find or to get positive samples from those bats. So just because you can't find it in the cerebrospinal fluid doesn't mean that it's not there um, or even there significantly. It just might be below the threshold level of what we need to find the positive result. So 
SARS-CoV-2 has been t detected only scarcely in the cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, thus, the cellular or humoral autoimmunity might contribute to neurological symptoms similar to other viral diseases. So remember, this similar to other viral diseases. So a lot of other viruses do this type of stuff as well. And we are just allowing a brand new virus to do this. Anyways, potential mechanisms include molecular mimicry between viral proteins and neuronal autoantigens and delayed stimulation of post-viral autoimmunity, similar to NMDA receptor encephalitis following herpes simplex virus encephalitis. So, um, let's see. So we have potential mechanisms include the molecular mimicry between the viral proteins and neural neuronal autoantigens and also delayed stimulation of post-viral autoimmunity similar to NMDA. So with herpes simplex virus encephalitis that there is some molecular mimicry going on between herpes simplex virus and this NMDA receptor. However, this is delayed. It could take a long time between getting herpes simplex and getting this post-viral autoimmunity, um, which is similar to the NMDA receptor. So that is something that we need to be worried about as well, is if we do have these autoimmune diseases as a result of SARS-CoV-2 or any other virus, really, uh, but since SARS-CoV-2 is going to sweep across the entire world all at once, we're going to have to take on the, the problem all at once, and we might not be able to uh, keep up. Regardless, um, NMDA, uh, how do I phrase that? So, there might be, with SARS-CoV-2, an autoimmune disease or a group of a subset of people who contract it will create an autoimmune disease. And this autoimmune disease might take months to a year, years to uh, fully develop. So you need to be aware. You need to be cognizant of the fact that if you contract this virus, you might not even show your autoimmune symptoms for years to come. So just be warned, that is something that might happen. So is this fear-mongering? Yes, but it is also truth-mongering. I will be truth-mongering the fact that these autoimmunity diseases take, sometimes will take months to years before they fully manifest themselves as a disease. So just truth-monger that, okay? Uh, we therefore examine the presence of large of a large panel of antineuronal and antiglial antibodies in serum and the cerebral spinal fluid of COVID-19 patients with predominant neurological symptoms. So here are the methods. So between March and May 2020, during the major rise of SARS-CoV-2 infections in Germany, neurological assessments uh, uh, neurological assessment was performed on COVID-19 patients during an intensive care unit treatment in two tertiary care centers. So here is the I would not be able to tell you how to pronounce this. Charité, <laughs> Charité, uh, Universitätsmedizin Berlin, Campus uh, Virchow Klinikum, or CVK, and the Campus Benjamin Franklin, or CBF, and Universitä Universitätsklinikum Freiburg. So in 11 patients with otherwise not explained neurological symptoms, uh, lum lumbar puncture was performed for autoantibody diagnostics in the cerebral spinal fluid and blood. A written informed consent for each research and publication was obtained for all patients of their legal representative or their legal representative. So they got their ethics committee approval. Autoantibodies against intracellular and surface antigens relevant for central nervous system diseases were measured by line blots, ELISA, and cell-based assays. So um, I do not know what a line blot is, so, oops, line blots, biochemistry. Is it a type of Western blot? Okay. Well, okay, I'm not, I'm not familiar with what a line blot is, but if it's a Western blot, uh, it's using an antibody that recognizes proteins, or sorry, it's a way to uh, separate proteins 
And by separating the proteins, you are then able to um, identify particular ones based on their size or what, what have you. So they did, I will presume these are Western blots, um, ELISA and other cell-based or and cell-based assays. And they include autoantibodies against, uh, these are just a bunch of, um, so these, all of these are just a bunch of different receptors or surface antigens on nervous tissues and uh, nervous system tissues. So they checked all of these. And in addition, indirect immunofluorescence or on unfixed mirroring brain, uh, unfixed mirroring brain sections was performed to search for novel autoantibodies not included in the clinical routine assays. So they, yeah, I was right when we said this earlier. They, so they took, they took mouse brain, they cut it up, and then they incubated these mouse brains with the uh, cerebro, cerebrospinal fluid and with the um, plasma, and by incubation, if there was a novel or a new antibody that is not um, that is not against one of these receptors that they have over here, they would still be able to see the fluorescence as a result of of these antibodies, and they should also have. Um, they should have a control as well, just to see if there's like non-descript or what the word be non-specific binding as well. Uh, but regardless, let's keep on going. So here's the results. The patient characteristics. So after a median of 12 days after onset of respiratory sim symptoms, so between seven and 17 days, 11 patients, um, and this is their median age, presented with a broad spectrum of neurological symptoms, including a downbeat uh, nystagmus, what is that? A vision condition. Okay, so where the eyes make repetitive, uncontrolled movements. So, yeah, this is downbeat nystagmus. Their eyes were not working properly. Or other ocular motor disturbances, so where they cannot move their eyes properly. Um, and aphasia, and I forgot what aphasia was. Inability to uh, understand. Loss of ability to understand or express speech, really. Okay, so... We have hyper and hypoactive delirium in five patients. We have partial, mainly orofacial myoclonus, which I believe is the the palsies that we were talking about uh, earlier. Let's uh, la regular. Oh, twitching of the muscle or group of muscles. Okay, so uh, twitching of face muscles. So that would probably be a type of palsy. I, I'm not a medical doctor, so I wouldn't be able to tell you explicitly what all these mean. And then we have the generalized stimulus sensitive um, myoclonus, which improved by sedation and symptomatic treatment. And then we have uh, dystonia of the upper extremities, stroke in one, and epileptic seizures in one as well. And the symptoms are not secondary to ICU treatment or explained by infection or internal diseases. So these were explicitly patients where they couldn't find another reason uh, for their neurological symptoms. So I presume if they had a group of people who had these symptoms but then also had uh, an infection as well or a co-infection, then they would exclude those people because then you could theoretically explain their nervous damage or their nervous uh, nervous system pathologies on something else. So here, this is they were looking at something that wouldn't explain any of the other things. Now, granted, one of the things that I need to mention is that these people were between uh, 54 and 78 years old. And so as you get older, um, one of the things that just happens as you get older is you start developing more autoantibodies just from getting older. So the older you are, the more opportunities have been presented to you to accidentally create an, an autoantibody or an autoimmune disease. So it could theoretically be possible that these patients were developing these autoantibodies just from getting older. Okay. Now, granted, you might, let's say you do produce a low level of these autoantibodies as you get older. If you get a virus infection that mimics uh, one of these, or should say that one of these autoantibodies can latches onto, then you're actually going to increase the production of these autoantibodies because then your body is going to 
use those autoantibodies to attack the virus because um, that virus is going to be activating the white blood cells that are producing these antibodies. So as the virus goes through, it will randomly, these antigens will float around and activate the white blood cells in that area. And if the white blood cell happens to be an autoantibody as well, it is going to allow that white blood cell or stimulate those white blood cells. And please forgive me, I forgot exactly which white blood cells do this, but it's going to cause them to pro proliferate more and then produce more of these autoantibodies. So this could be a method by which these viruses are not only causing the autoimmunity in a lot of people, but also uh, in increasing the severity of these autoantibodies in a group of people. Okay, so uh, how do I, so just the fact, I, this is where I'm going to criticize this, this paper a little bit. So just because you can find these autoantibodies in people doesn't mean that it's coming from the virus. Okay, it just means that they are in large enough concentrations now to detect. And I would presume if you tested uh, these people within the ages 54 to 78, you, without known clinical symptoms, you probably would be able to detect these autoantibodies as well. But if the virus is making it worse, then you have an issue. And this could be one of the reasons why older people seem to be having more severe disease outcome, because the older you are, the more likely you're going to have an autoimmune disease anyway. Um, let's continue. So symptoms are not psych oh yeah, um, so here are the laboratory findings in the SARS-CoV-2 patients with neurological symptoms. So cerebrospinal fluid and blood samples were all analyzed in all patients, uh, were analyzed in all patients. Uh, SARS-CoV-2 PCR and cerebrospinal fluid was negative in all patients. So good, they, um, if they did detect the virus in the cerebrospinal fluid, then they could say, ah yes, the virus is attacking these nerves directly, and therefore this is what's causing the nervous system to be damaged. But here, um, they said no, the, the PCR tests, they're not, uh, they're not positive, therefore the virus concentrations is probably low enough to create a discernible difference. So we need to look for something else, something bigger, uh, Occam's, razor, Occam's razor, we need to find something that is more likely going to be the cause. And so, um, yeah, that's what they did here. They, they screened out the people. If they, I would presume there might have been others with neurological symptoms, but they did find the virus in the cerebral spinal fluid, and so they excluded those people from this study. Anyways, there is mild pleocytosis, and this is found in three out of 11 patients and elevated in one with a positive varis, varicella virus PCR. Um, what is pleocytosis? Uh, an increased cell count, particularly in white blood cell count in a body fluid. Okay, so the so mild pleocytosis, so at elevated levels, presumably, I would guess, of white blood cells was found in the serum and or the cerebral spinal fluid samples of three out of the eleven patients, and uh, it was elevated, or and it was very elevated in one with a positive varicella virus PCR. So I presume, um, let's look up varicella virus if this is, oh, chickenpox. Okay, so, I mean, granted, if you find, yeah, so this person might have just had enough of a uh, chickenpox virus in, so you don't, you never really lose chickenpox, right? So chickenpox will uh, incorporate its DNA into a subset of your nerve cells. And so you will always be at risk of having a, uh, a re-emergence of chickenpox because um, they will activate randomly. I, I shouldn't say randomly, but they will activate uh, spontaneously. And uh, hopefully your immune system is able to fight them off every time they do erupt. And eventually those numbers should get lower and lower. Uh, but sometimes that doesn't happen and you end up getting shingles later in life. So uh, this person had enough in their cerebral spinal fluid to be able to detect it. Regardless, the cerebral spinal fluid protein was elevated in 4 out of 11 and matched oligo, oligoclonal bands, or OCB, present in 6 out of 9 patients. So 
I don't know what the oligoclonal bands are. So are bands of immunoglobulins that are seen when a patient's blood serum or cerebral spinal fluid is analyzed and they are used to, in the diagnosis of various neurological and blood diseases. Okay, so this is an example of the oligoclonal bland. So just know that it is um, CSF protein was elevated and match oligoclonal clonal ban bands present in 6 out of 9 patients. Okay, just I won't be able to tell you exactly what that all means. So using routine diagnostics, one patient showed, uh, I don't know if this is yo antibodies or Y sub not antibodies. So um, let us look up is so paraneoplastic cerebellar cerebellar degeneration. So let's look up yo. Okay, so yo is call, also called CDR2. And this is one of the reasons why I hate biochemistry and molecular biology is because they will have a million, um, a million different ways to say the same thing. So, oh shoot, maybe that isn't right. So sorry, uh, I won't be able to tell you what exactly the yo is um, because, okay, so it's called CDR2 because it's part of the cerebellar degeneration related protein 1. So um, if you have antibodies against this particular gene um, the, or this particular protein, you end up with the cerebellar degeneration related protein. Uh, cerebellar degeneration. Okay, well, regardless, uh, that is also called yo, and I won't be able to tell you why it's called yo, so I, I apologize. And one patient showed these yo autoantibodies in serum and CSF, and two patients oh had myelin autoantibodies in serum. So myelin, remember, this is the, the myelin sheets are a it's a protein wrapping around the exons or the long parts of the neuron. So um, if you have antibodies that attacks the myelin sheath or of these nerve cells, it ends up degrading them and destroying them, which then makes it more difficult for the electrical impulses to pass through the exon. And so when you have a loss of myelin sheath, you can end up with things such as multiple sclerosis and other types of um, just other types of neurological disease, diseases. And so these people, or two of the 11 patients, had these anti-myelin antibodies. So this is not good. This is telling me, um, yeah, this is, this is seriously uh, scaring me a little bit. So one patient had high levels of serum IgG, uh, NMDA. So this is, remember, this is that other receptor. Um, and the neurofilament light chain levels in the cerebrospinal fluid were increased in all tested patients. So all of the tested patients seem to have uh, the biomarker of damaged axons. So that is also not good at all. So the screening assay for novel CSF autoantibodies in SARS-CoV-2 positive patients so the CSF analysis for the presence of antineuronal autoantibodies not included in the commercial routine assays using indirect immuno, immunofluorescence or on unfixed mouse brain sections. So unfixed means that they didn't add a fixing agent. So when we add a fixing agent to a tissue, it will actually um, uh, lock up all the proteins and lock up the entire thing in place. Um, but if it's unfixed, then there's still a little bit of squishiness uh, allowed in it. So anyways, they have, they used unfixed mouse brain sections and uh, this reproducibly showed strong IgG binding in most patients. So they took the, the cerebrospinal fluid and the um, plasma from these patients and they incubated it with the mouse brain sections. And then they showed that there was a very strong IgG response. And remember, the IgGs, these are the long-term antibodies, so they don't go away very 
quickly. They, they do lower over time for a disease, but not as quickly as, say, the IgMs. And um, these are the Y-shaped uh, antibodies. And so they take these, they incubated the plasma and the cerebral spinal fluid with these mouse brain tissues. If there are antibodies though, that do attack the mouse brain, they will go in and attack the mouse brain, and we would presume that the there is enough similarity between the the proteins in your brain and the proteins in a mouse brain that um, if an antibody will stick to the mouse brain, it should also stick to your brain. And this isn't exactly always going to be the case, but that is the presumption here. Um, and I, I can see a little bit of a problem because I do know that mice at least their pro melanocortinin uh, protein is a little bit smaller. Um, it's missing some sections, and so they might be missing some peptides that your own brain might be producing. Regardless, uh, let's keep on going because that's getting a little too technical. Um, they first allow these IgG antibodies to attack the mouse brain, and then they will use a um, something that will stick to the tail end of the IgG antibody and um, then create it creates fluorescence, or if you shine UV light on it, it ends up creating fluorescence, and this fluorescence can be seen on a microscope slide. So um, IgG staining patterns included vessel uh, endothelium. So what they did was they looked at the tissues, and these are the cells that are, are showing, or that are lighting up with fluorescence. And so you have the vessel endothelium, which um, here's the endothelium of the blood vessel. So it looks like somehow you're creating autoantibodies against the um, blood vessels as well. So it's not just the nervous system that we need to worry about. It, it appears to be also be the uh, blood vessels as well are getting some autoantibody attack, which makes sense to me. So we have some of that. We have the paranuclear antigens. So let's look up what paranuclear um, you know what, what does paranuclear mean? Surrounding the nucleus of a cell. So, uh, they can see the area around the nucleus of these nervous nerve cells that those are also being, uh, lit up with fluorescence. So there must be a protein in that area that is being attacked by your autoantibodies. Um, the astrocytic proteins... So these are the proteins of the astrocytes or the star-shaped um, glia of your brain as well. And neutropil of the basal ganglia, hippocampus, or olf olfactory bulbs. So I don't, let me remember, remind myself. Uh, so the neutropil are a dense network of interwoven nerve fibers and their branches and synapses together with glial fil filaments. So... These are unmyelinated axons, dendrocytes, and glial, and glial cells. Wait. Process that form a synaptically dense region containing a relatively no, low number of cell bodies. So these are just areas with very few nuclei and a bunch of different branches uh, that all make this, you know, these bulbs, right? So all of that seemed to show that there are autoantibodies directly attacking these areas. So although antigenic, the antigenic epitopes are currently unknown, the intense staining indicates high specificity to certain neuronal astrocyte and vascular proteins. So, um, so when they say the antigenic epitopes are unknown, they do not know what amino acid sequences or what types of carbohydrates, um, if it's a glycosylated protein, they don't know what, what on these cells is causing the autoantibody attack. So remember, your cells have a bunch of different proteins on them. And um, when they did these panels over here, um, let me... So remember, these panels that have all these other proteins that they look at, um, those panels tell you expl explicitly what proteins are being attacked by the autoantibodies. But this microscope slide... Uh, this immunofluorescence is not telling you what protein is doing it. They're just telling you 
what cells and what tissues are being attacked. And so those cells and tissues will have a bunch of different proteins on them, so you do not know which protein or which epitope is causing the uh, fluorescence or causing the autoantibodies to stick to them. And since uh, they're also saying that there is specificity, so it's not attacking all of the nerves equally, it, they seem to be concentrating around different ones, which would tell you uh, that that's sort of acting like the control. They are getting large numbers of them, which indicates that there is going to be a disease progression as a result, but then also it is specific. So it's not like they're just coding everything, which would tell you, oh, how do we know they, they're not just coding everything because of my, the way that I ran my test, right? So if you ran your test in a way that for some reason makes the autoantibodies fall out of solution easily, that could tell you, oh yeah, it, it's non-specific. it doesn't matter, except the fact that they are seeing it uh, specific to certain cell types that is telling them, yes, this is something that we need to worry about. So uh, the discussion, so we report the autoantibody findings in 11 critically ill COVID-19 patients presenting with a variety of neurological symptoms with unexplained etiology or uh, unexplained causes. So cardiopulmonary resuscitation was required after uh, asystole, asystole, I, shoot, I forgot. Oh, yeah, so that's when there is no, it's cardiac arrest. So there is no, um, there is no pulse on the cardiogram. Anyways, so after asystole in one patient with high level of serum IgG autoantibodies against NMDA receptors, possibly reflecting NMDA receptor encephalitis. So inflammation of the brain that is the result of autoantibodies or an autoimmune disease against this particular receptor. This is well studied and uh, in which arrhythmia and autonomic dysfunction are common. So the arrhythmia, the irregular beating of the heart and the autonomic dysfunction or the, um, how do I phrase that? The ability to function autonomously um, Let's see, so autonomic nerve disorder. So I, what is the autonomic nerve? I, is that the nerve that causes a bunch of your automatic processes? Yeah, so it's the part of the nervous system that regulates these automatic uh, processes such as digestion or the heart rate. Uh, these are coming from the nerve. So if someone has if someone has autoantibodies against NMDA, frequently they get encephalitis and arrhythmia and these autonomic dysfunctions are common with this particular autoimmune disease. So yes, uh, that it ended up matching their, their uh, conclusion. So symptomatic treatment with valproic acid and uh, clonazepam was successfully administered in two patients with myoclonus and due to the retrospective nature of the study, our findings could not guide treatment, treating physicians to uh, initiate immunomodulatory therapy. So since this was a retro, retrospective, uh, if they were able to get this out earlier, they might say, hey, maybe we need to give an immune, immunomodulatory treatment to these people to suppress their autoantibody responses. So a recent clinical improvement of the COVID-19 patients with the guillain barre syndrome has been reported after therapy with intravenous or intravenous immunoglobulins or IVIGs. Um, so good, it seems that some people have had improvement with their GBS after therapy with the immunoglobulins and after steroids in COVID-19 patients with encephalitis. So it appears as though uh, steroids will often suppress the immune system as well. So it appears as though these steroids might be playing a role in helping prevent the progression of these autoimmune diseases. So this is indicating that immunotherapy should be considered in the future cases of the cerebrospinal fluid autoantibody positive COVID-19 patients. So they're not saying that everyone with COVID-19 is getting this autoantibody response, but a lot of people probably are. Okay, so we need to consider taking these panels or these tests on a subset of the people who test positive for the disease and then giving them, give them immunomodulatory treatment if they do end up testing positive for these autoantibodies. So in most patients, 
Increased use of protein lactate or white blood cells with negative SARS-CoV-2 PCR indicated inflammatory changes compatible with autoimmune encephalitis. So, um, yeah, the, the biomarkers that they looked at show that there is, um, or that the biomarkers are compatible with the autoimmune diseases that they are describing right now. So NFL was markedly elevated uh, in CSF of four of the COVID-19 patients, thus exceeding established cutoff values uh, for rapidly progressing neurodegenerative diseases, such as amyotrophic lateral sclerosis and multi-system atrophy. So this is something that is scaring me a little bit, is that, um, so this NFL, and le <laughs> uh, let's look up NFL protein. Uh, and that doesn't work. Uh, well, let's say biomarker. Let hopefully that. Oh, the neurofilament light chain. Okay, so this is what we looked at earlier. So this is a protein that uh, is seen in high concentrations when you have axon damage. It's looking like so in four of the eleven COVID nineteen patients, this is well past the cutoff value of rapidly progressing neurodegenerative diseases. So if since we found this in four out of the 11 patients, this can tell us that those patients probably well, were experiencing a neurodegenerative disease. And that is, um, it is scary to think that that is probably going to be the reality for a bunch of people uh, very acutely. So shortly after contracting the virus, they might experience this very quickly. But remember, uh, neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative diseases frequently will continue to progress even after you've healed. So autoimmune diseases are no joke. They are something that will stay with you until you get treatment. And so one thing that I'm worried about right now is <laughs> what if we have a bunch of young people who are going out and about right now, contracting the disease, thinking that they are going to be fine, and then they end up with an autoimmune disease four or five years down the line? That is something, and not just any autoimmune disease, but nervous system autoimmune diseases. This is something that we should not just play around with. Yes, other viruses can cause this, but we have... We have a well-established uh, clinical literature and methodologies to treat all of these new disease or all these previously previous diseases that circular circulate around the world over and over again. This is a novel coronavirus, and so therefore, I am I am generally worried that we will not have the technology to treat everyone simultaneously. So, let us keep on going. And uh, this high level of the neurofilament L, this is also found, or neurofilament light chain, this is also found in autoimmune encephalitis. So NFL, elevated NFL levels might reflect direct tissue destruction from viral replication or from inflammatory damage. Whether this is a transient elevation or a continuous trans transformation into degenerative phenotype is yet to be determined. Okay, so let me be very explicit right now. Whether or not this is a transient or something that will just come and go, you know, some you might develop these autoantibodies once, maybe your body is able to lower them very quickly, which it sounds like the immunity or the antibodies for coronavirus tend to go down quickly. One of the reasons they go down quickly, well, that might be your body saying, I don't want these here, right? They might be attacking me, right? So um, whether or not this is a transient elevation or continuous transformation into a degenerative phenotype, this is yet to be determined. Okay. Now, let's say the damage that is being caused is irreversible or barely reversible. We will run into the issue where you have a 
continuously degenerative disease. And if it's continuously degenerative, then um, people are only going to get worse over time. Okay. And if people are only getting worse, that is going to be um, an issue that we all, I guess, what would the word be? We need to be prepared for that future, is what I'm saying. We need to be prepared for the fact that maybe people in their 50s thought, oh yeah, I'm going to uh, live out my retirement. But now, if they end up getting Alzheimer's or multiple sclerosis uh, five years into retirement, then all of a sudden they are no longer enjoying their golden years. Rather than enjoying their golden years, they end up now being, uh, they end up now not being able to walk or eat for themselves, or they're stuck in a in an assisted care living facility because, well, will we even have enough assisted living care facilities for the influx of people that are going to have these neurodegenerative diseases? Maybe, maybe not. So let's keep on going. I'm going to get myself depressed. So the high frequency of CSF antineuronal and antiglial autoantibodies is remarkable as it is the confinement to specific immunofluorescence patterns. I need to look at what the glial cells do explicitly. Um, so although more than one patient each had IgG autoantibodies targeting neutropil, astrocytes, or medium-sized blood vessels, it will require larger patient cohorts for linking a given autoantibody pattern to clinical symptoms. So what we would hope to do is after enough people have contracted this disease, we would take samples of the cerebral spinal fluid, we would uh, run a test on them to see which cell types end up being attacked by these autoantibodies, and then we would try to uh, use that information to correlate uh, cell type with disease progression. And so, um, yeah, this is just one of the future studies that we should be doing. So we regularly encounter small in immunofluorescence patterns in patients with autoimmune encephalitis, but not in healthy control uh, CSF, or cerebral spinal fluid. So good, they have a control. So as most of these novel autoantigens have yet are yet to be determined, it is challenging to judge whether CSF autoantibodies in COVID-19 are pathogenic or not. Uh, the neutrophil pattern in some patients is just binding to surface receptors or ion channels and thus pathogenicity. So if you do have autoantibodies against the receptor ion, um, ion channels, that usually would progress into uh, into a path, or it would cause pathology. Anyway, similar to the rapidly growing group of autoantibody-mediated encephalit encephalitides, uh, likewise, the astrocyte pattern in two patients is reminiscent of the relatively common form of GFAP antibody encephalitis, and this is just another receptor. Other antigens, however, are located intracellularly, intracellularly indicating that the humoral immune response is secondary to other immune mechanisms, including central nervous system damage from cytotoxic T cells and innate autoimmunity. So post-viral auto autoimmunity is an emerging concept best studied for NMDA receptor encephalitis, developing in almost 30% of cases post the herpes simplex encephalitis. I think that's what that was. Uh, don't quote me on that. Uh, the tissue destruction may lead to the release of the brain-restricted neoantigens, such as NMDA receptors, and viral material might provide co-stimulatory signals to autoantibody or to antibody-producing cells. Recent findings suggest that several viral infections can lead to secondary autoimmune encephalitis, including uh, EBV, HHV6, enterovirus, adenovirus, hepatitis C, or HIV infections. Thus, the presenting findings suggest that SARS-CoV-2 is no exception to this general principle, and the following months will show whether such auto-reactivity can cause 
uh, persisting neurological morbidity even after clearance of SARS-CoV-2 and remission of COVID-19. So here they're saying that only in the next few months will we start seeing whether or not um, these autoreactive antibodies are causing persistent neurological morbidities or if they go away. Yeah. In a way re reminiscent of the unexplained severe encephalitis lethargica, um, commonly with post-encephalitic Parkinsonism in more than a million patients of the in influenza pandemic of 1918. So uh, encephalitis lethargica, I would assume this is when people were ju just tired? Sleeping sickness, okay. So this is, um, oh, distinct from, this is distinct from the tsetse fly version of sleeping sickness. So this is described in 1917 by the neurologist Konstantin von Economo and the pathologist Jean-René Cruchet, and the disease attacks the brains, leaving some victims in a statue-like condition, speechless and motionless. Um, so between 1915 and 1926, an epidemic of this encephalitis lethargica spread around the world, and nearly 5 million people were affected, a third of whom died in the acute stages. Many of those who survived neither returned to their pre-existing aliveness. They would be conscious and aware, yet not fully awake. They would sit motionless and speechless all day in their chairs, totally lacking energy, impetus, initiative, motive, appetite, effect, or desire. They registered what went on about them without active attention and with profound indifference. They neither conveyed nor felt the feelings of life, and they, they were as insubstantial as ghosts and as passive as zombies. So here they're tying it with the influenza pandemic, um, and I think I might have heard of, I think I might have watched another video about this as well. I don't know if they made the, did they make the connection with the influenza? Oops. Oh, sorry. I accidentally stopped the recording. So. In, okay, we'll, we'll keep on going. So, thus, the present findings suggest that SARS-CoV-2 is no exception, and uh, together, the high frequency of autoantibodies targeting the brain in the absence of other explanations suggests a casual association with clinical symptoms, in particular with hyperexcitability, uh, myoclonus seizures, while several underlying autoantigens still await identification in future studies, presence of autoantibodies may explain some aspects of multi-organ disease in COVID-19 and guide immunotherapy in selected cases. So uh, here they have the patient numbers, and here they, um, when they, this is the autoantibody panel, and this is telling them what autoantibodies were present um, in this panel, and it seems as though every one of these patients had something, something that showed positive. Uh, for all these things. And for the CSF indirect immunofluorescence IgGs, they also showed what parts uh, ended up lighting up. And it looks like all of them had the, at least some autoantibodies for something. So here they have examples of the brain tissue. And remember when I said that they would fluoresce. So these, the green that you're seeing here is a fluorescent uh, something that is fluorescent that is shining under the UV light. And so they are showing that there is some specific types of fluorescent patterns that are appearing in these. So with that, I'm going to uh, head on off. Uh, I will hopefully have another video by the end of the day that is a little bit more upbeat. Um, but yeah, just, just be warned. There, we might be facing a pandemic of neurological conditions, not just depression, but things such as multiple sclerosis, 
sleeping sickness, maybe uh, Alzheimer's, uh, Parkinson's, we might be dealing with this within the next year, two, three, four years. So do not allow yourself to contract SARS-CoV-2 because we do not know all of the possible side effects. And with that, oh, and I will also say that this is why we're vaccin our vaccinations have to go through uh, FDA approval. When we do, when we run these experiments, these exper these, uh, or when we do the vaccine development, we find out whether or not there are things such as antibody dependent enhancement that is going to take place. And we do not want that to happen because that will make the virus uh, disease progression more severe. Um, we'll do things to see if it causes any autoimmunity uh, disease or if it causes autoimmunity. And if it does, we need to make sure that we are avoiding the antigens that cause autoimmunity because um, if we develop autoimmunity through a vaccine that is going to also not be good. So um, especially if this virus is doing a very good job at mimicking our own proteins, that is not going to uh, bode well for vaccine development. Okay, with that, I'm going to head on off and hopefully I will have a more upbeat video by the end of the day. So uh, with that, please uh, subscribe if you want and I will see you next time.